there are two things that have come out of Scandinavia in recent years which are sadly much overlooked by the general public but utterly adored by anyone who's in the know on in on the secret. One is Troll Hunter. Troll! The other, Saab. And today we're looking at a first generation Saab 95 from 2001. Like Troll Hunter, Saabs have always had a really fiercely loyal following and people who love it will love it. In fact, I'm going to go watch this film now. Sorry about that. So in 1998, this car was revealed to the world to replace the aging 9000 in the battle against the BMW 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class. And those who love Saabs were instantly excited and really wanted one. People who are really into BMW and Mercedes probably less so because they're going to be buying it for the badge and maybe not risking it on something different. Maybe the real competition was things like the Alpha 166. But it went on sale in 1999 and then we got to experience the truly amazing over-engineering of Saab at their best. Although the car is based on a GM platform, there's hardly any GM material in the car at all, even though the design brief was to try and use as much GM product as possible to keep costs down. Typically, Saab being Saab, completely re-engineered the platform. I think maybe the wheel nuts and the uh, window mirror switch are the same as you'll find in a Vectra. This interior is beautiful and scandy to the max. Just the shapes they've used and the materials, it's clearly not a German car or an Italian car, it's very not British. Everything about it, even the seating position, is just so different. You can't mistake it for anything else. Even though being a late 90s car, cramming a lot of technology into an older style interface, so there are a lot of buttons down here, it still has a certain minimalistic feel but it's beautifully laid out, very cleverly thought through. Everything is in exactly the right place. And they're still harking back to their fighter days. We'll talk more about that on the road. All right, so key into the uh, floor mounted, or well, tunnel mounted, I should say, ignition. Into D and away we go. It's quite nice on the dashboard between the speedo and the temperature gauge. There's a nice little, uh, Park reverse neutral drive 321 indicator with a light on it, so that indicator is in your eye line, so you don't have to look too far from the, uh, the road ahead. Now, this is an automatic version of the car. The manual was significantly faster, but this is no slouch. It's an old school four speed made by ASIN, which in traffic is, is quite nice in that it uh, takes the effort out of a traffic jam, but if I'm honest, it's not the greatest thing, but this is a luxury cruiser. Let's not forget that. And because it's a luxury cruiser, let's start by talking about the interior. This is gorgeously comfortable. These seats are big, big cushions. They have big Scandinavian leather armchairs. They look flat and unsupportive, but actually they do kind of mold to your body quite well. So my back feels like the bolsters are kind of wrapped around me in a very comforting and supportive manner, which is nice. As I said when I sat in the car park, the switch gear just falls perfectly to hand. Everything is ideally located. You couldn't plan it better and neither could they because they obviously spent a long time planning it very well. And these seats can also be adjusted in lots of different ways. It's all mechanical, no electric stuff adding weight to the car. And this dashboard is obviously aircraft inspired. I'll come on to Saab's history in a moment, but they have, whereas BMW have their, their wraparound feel, Saab had a very similar idea where they used to make cars driver's seat feel like the cockpit of a fighter jet because they started out making planes back in a long time ago. It's designed for those unrelenting, merciless Scandinavian winters where you know, in Sweden you've got several feet of snow and it's minus 25 degrees centigrade. This car will carry on. So, so you've got multiple air vents everywhere. The driver has two vents beside you, so one for the window, one for your face. Likewise for the passenger, although they're spread out more, and one in the centre as well. You've got multi-stage heated seats, which you know, back in the 90s was kind of a big deal. Most cars only got on off, really. And my favourite thing, well my two favourite things actually, on this dashboard, a real proper quirkiness, are the night panel button. So at night time you can turn off everything except the glowing speedo, then nothing distracts you. And this wonderful curling fold-out cup holder, which does a little ballet dance as it unfurls before your eyes. How wonderful is that? 
It's also worth mentioning how much space there is in here. It's a big car and it really feels it. You've got so much space all around you for well, your legs, your arms, your head. There is no cramps anywhere. The back seats are also very commodious. And the boot, even though it's a saloon, not an estate, you could live in there. Interestingly, the estate version of the 95 was the first Saab estate since 1975. Ah, I bought a coffee and now it's dissolved. The cup is dissolving around me. Oh, bumsy. Now Saab as a company is absolutely fascinating. And they always ridiculously over-engineered their cars. And that's why back in the 60s and 70s, it was the kind of car an architect or a lawyer would have bought. Someone who was really meticulous and cared about details. Everything feels over-engineered. Even the air vents feel way too complex. They're made of like a pack of cards almost. Lots of little tiny layers moving on top of each other. That must cost a fortune to create. No wonder they went bust. This uh, massive, well, it's double din and a bit really gap. In fact, it's double double din looking at it from top to bottom. Your clock and the uh, various information about the car is in this large LCD screen at the very top. And then below you've got a standard double din size. It's a radio cassette and CD player all in one, which is rather fabulous. And below that you've got your dual zone climate control, which goes down to a numbing 15 degrees centigrade. So either they have some very warm summers over in Scandinavia, or they're all so used to being chilly in the snow they can't get used to being warm in the car. Or more likely because America was a big market for Saab and they wanted to be ready for that. I'm going to suggest that's probably more realistic. They were one of the older car manufacturing companies in the world as well. So it really is an absolute tragedy that they aren't around anymore because they built some of the finest cars around. Even the Swan Song, the second generation of this car, which was the Ypsilon 2 uh, GM platform based 9.5, which admittedly got some slightly less than rave reviews, unfortunately, um, was still an engineering marvel compared to the um, you know, Vauxhall Insignia and Buick Regal that it shared the platform with. Now, I nearly bought one of these cars when I bought my Mondeo last summer. There was actually a 9.5 estate sat next to it. It was a beautiful car in metallic green with, well, it looked like it had a, a good history, or, but had a couple of lights on the dashboard and that put me off. And I've regretted not buying that car ever since. I mean, 800 pounds for that thing. And I've spent a thousand on that Mondeo that cost me thousands more to not get working properly. Why didn't I buy that Saab? Oh, on the road, this does feel executive big car quality. You can feel the weight and the heft of the thing but it does kind of glide in an interesting manner. It kind of swoops over bumps and things in a very pleasant manner. There's, even though this car's got about 127,000 miles on it, it doesn't squeak and it doesn't rattle. It doesn't bump or crash. You go over bumps and the suspension just soaks everything up. There's nothing to worry about anywhere. I've never driven down this road, even though it's about five miles from my house. I've no idea where it goes, and it's very twisty. My only driving criticism of this car is the fact that because the bonnet and the overhangs are so long, and it all just swoops away with that quite elegant styling, you uh, can't really see the front corners particularly easily. That would take a bit of getting used to it, hopefully not by touch. Here in the driving seat, the sitting position, the materials, the layout of the dashboard, it is all unmistakably a 90s vehicle. But that's not to its detriment and it's a very relaxing thing to drive and actually very enjoyable. It doesn't, it really doesn't make you feel like you're in an old car. You, you feel like you're in a quality car more than anything else. That's the overriding feeling you get is, is quality. And a car that will, will last forever. I would say this is probably made as well, if not better, than my Mercedes W123. Now this particular Saab 95 left the factory with 185 horsepower and 280 newton meters of torque, which is fairly respectable, let's be honest. All this comes from its 2290cc or 2.3 litre B235 turbocharged four-cylinder inline engine. But after a remap, this is now making 235 horsepower and 380 newton meters of torque, which makes it a very relaxing drive. Now generally, this just means you have more go 
and are more able to get away from the lights without much effort. But if you push the S button here on the gear stick, you drop into sport mode and that livens things up an awful lot because it hangs onto gears longer, the car just wakes up completely. I'm in a 40 mile an hour limit, so right now I'm cruising in fourth. This is only a four speed auto with, uh, with kick down, but you will notice an instant improvement in acceleration. Out to the roundabout, that is ridiculous. From a standstill, this will light up a tire at ridiculous ease. I'm just passing by, it may catch on the over the shoulder camera. A Mark III Mondeo ST220, and I've really got a big soft spot for these cars. I don't know why, considering all the pain mine caused me. I still think those estates are one of the finest looking wagons you can buy. I might have to go and get another one one day. That's just painful. Why am I hurting myself? Don't do that. Stop it. Do not buy another Mark III Mondeo. You don't need it in your life. Buy something, anything else. So yeah. We're now cruising through the 50 zone and we'll shortly be entering the national speed limit. It is uphill, but I will give you a indication of how rapidly this car can accelerate. There was a hot version of the Aero. I'm not sure what hot stood for, but that meant it was the high power one. And the actual factory figures were remarkably similar to what this car has been mapped to. And in its day, the hot Aero would out drag a Porsche 911 from 40 to 90 mph. I don't know how many of those races went on, but I would love to have seen the look on both of those drivers' faces afterwards. And because these cars were very rapid, very solid, and incredibly reliable, they were popular with police forces. I mean, obviously, Sweden, Norway, they were marked liveried estates as well as unmarked cars. In Scotland, they had three unmarked cars which were ready to get out and catch bad guys completely unawares. So there's often a speed camera van on the bridge we've just gone under, so um, being very careful to keep it under the limit just in case. Now, in a moment, I will see how briskly we can do the 50 to 70 run. The moment we pass the national limit sign, I will hit the loud pedal. Okay, in. Three, two, one, go. Okay, that was rapid. That was actually very rapid. And it kept on going after I lifted off. So that is quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. And this car just wants to go. This is an astonishingly rapid vehicle. And it doesn't look it as a real, real Q car. And it really does have everything. This, is, this car is, it's fast, it's comfortable. It's got a massive boot, big back seat for uh, family, kids, whatever. It looks good and it goes completely under the radar. I think this in many ways could be the perfect car. Has this just out Mondeo the Mondeo? Gosh. And you can't talk about a Saab without talking about safety because Volvo take a lot of the credit for safety developments and things, but in fact Saab have often been the lead of the, and the winner in terms of safety. This car came with things like Saab active head restraint, which means if there's an accident, the headrests move forward and prevent whiplash. It has a pendulum B pillar, which is connected to the floor panel. So if there's a side impact, it draws the impact forces away from the driver. It is a very well thought out car. If you're gonna have a crash, this is a good car to have it in. But please don't, they're, they're too nice to crash. Okay, now I can't not do a proper 0 to 60 on this because in sport mode this is just hilarious. So finding a de-restricted back road that we can do 60 miles an hour on. Okay, coming to a halt. And hopefully this GoPro can see the speedometer so I can do a time off take Three, two, two one. one. Torque steering like crazy? crazy. Huh. huh, that was too twisty. Too torque steery to do properly. Okay, the road's too twisty to do it on, but it's a huge, it's lots of fun trying. I 
SK from Standstill, Sport Engaged. This thing just flies, it's ridiculous, and it's quite distracting well, when you first get in the car because it's got that wonderful little turbo needle that follows the boost as you accelerate. As everything's got a turbo now, it's not a novelty anymore, so manufacturers don't bother with that these days, which is a real shame because it's one of those wonderful little quirks that just makes the car just a bit more interesting. And my Saab, I think my Alpha 159 was the last car I had, or the newest car I've had, which had that same feature. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and uh, a huge thank you goes out to uh, viewer Alan, who was also the same guy who fixed the Rover a few weeks ago, and this was in the car park, and we couldn't leave without taking this car for a drive, honestly. Um, thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please hit like and subscribe if you have, if not, then just keep it to yourself, it's just rude. <laughs> See you next time.